We all know that when it comes to studying machine learning and topics like gradient descent, optimizers, chain rule, etc., we simply cannot skip calculus. It is extremely important to have at least a basic knowledge on this topic before starting your studies in machine learning. We are also aware that calculus is a huge, huge concept. It is so vast that it has almost no end of learning. So it becomes very difficult and confusing, especially for the new people to understand that what topics exactly they need to study in calculus and what should be the correct resource to prepare those topics. The only agenda of this particular lecture is to provide you the solution for all these questions that we have been discussing so far. I understand that it is not practically possible to cover the entire calculus within one video. Neither I am aiming for that. However, by the end of this lecture, we will make sure that we will have a good understanding and clear concept on all those basic topics within calculus which will be required as a prerequisite before learning topics like gradient descent, optimizers, chain rule and ROC AUC curves etc. Also since we are going to cover a lot of topics within this particular lecture hence the length of this video is going to be comparatively longer than the other tutorials within this playlist so far. So be ready to get a strong command on calculus basics grab a pen and paper and let's get started calculus has a very simple definition which says it is the mathematical study of continuous change and shortly we will see that how exactly we do the study of continuous change it has two sub branches one is differential calculus which we are going to cover first and then we will move into integral calculus as well and the idea is not to memorize the definitions formulas etc within these topics in fact we will try to understand conceptually in an intuitive way that if someone is saying that derivative of a constant is zero then what does that mean and how exactly that will be zero so let's start all these things one by one as i said earlier we are going to start with differential calculus which is known as the study of rates of changes so pay attention to this figure on your screen we have a progress of distance over time on this graph so let's say that you start walking from this point zero and after a certain time you reach to this point and then you took rest for a while so you had no progress at all and again from this point here you start walking again with a constant speed and as you can understand by this figure your progress kept on changing over time so at different times you had different different speed at a particular window you had no speed at all so there was no progress recorded and then again you started walking with a constant speed of course this entire progress cannot be mapped under one straight line but if we talk about a particular window let's say starting from this point to this point then we can map this progress within one straight line because the speed was constant over here so you had a constant speed within this particular window again if we talk about another time interval let's say between these two points then again the progress can be mapped within one straight line somewhere like this where your speed was comparatively bit higher Another straight line could be drawn like this where your speed started slowing down then on this particular window where you had no speed at all or no progress at all your progress can be mapped within a straight line like this. Of course my drawing is not that good so I apologize for that and again from this point to this point your progress can be mapped with the help of another straight line like this. So let me show you a clearer picture for these lines and it will look something like this and the slope of these lines are actually called the derivative for that particular time interval and this derivative is also equals to the value of the speed within that particular time frame because this slope has the value of distance by time so this is the distance let's say that this is the distance that you've been traveling and over this much of time you travel the distance so let's say this is the distance and this is the time and distance by time as we know is the formula of speed so these slopes or you can say the value of these slopes is representing your speed within different different time intervals for example with respect to this slope over here on the bottom when you started walking you had a warm-up speed then this particular slope the second one where your speed increased a bit and then this third slope is representing the speed where you started slowing down and then this one represents your speed when you traveled no distance at all so of course the value of this slope will be zero so with the help of these derivatives we are able to do the mathematical study 
of rate of change with respect to your speed it will look nicer if we will see on the next slide so let's say that i am representing the slope by m and the value of m on the initial point was half kilometers per minute and by the way these numbers are made up by me so please don't try to find any logic behind it on the second slope you had a speed of 2 kilometers then on the third slope when you started slowing down over here then your speed was again recorded as 1 kilometer and for this slope as we have discussed earlier it will be 0 as the value of m and then on the final slope you started walking with a constant speed of m is equals to 1 so we can understand that after analyzing the graph of the progress our speed was changing after a certain time interval at point it was half kilometers per minute then it was two kilometers then again it changed to one kilometer then we had no speed at all and then we ended up with a constant speed of one kilometers per minute and if we try to plot all these values on a different graph then it would look something like this so this time we have a graph of speed against time it is not the distance against time but it is the speed against time and as we know initially it was half kilometers per hour then on the peak it was two kilometers then it started declining with one kilometers per minute then we took some rest where we had no progress at all and then we ended up with a constant speed of one kilometers per minute so let's have a quick recap of what we have done so far so on figure one on the left hand side we had a progress of distance over time on figure 2 we started analyzing the rate of change of the speed and at different time interval we recorded different different speed which is also known as the derivative or the value of the slope and then on the third figure we tried to plot all these values of m on a graph of speed over time and this entire process is actually called the differentiation of distance with respect to time or you can also denote it as differentiation of d by dt because on the first figure itself we had nothing but distance and time and we were given that how the distance that we are covering it is changing over time and we wanted to do the study that with a small change in time how much change is there in distance and this is exactly what we call as first order derivative that we have here on figure 3 now if we want to do the derivative of this progress on figure 3 then that will be called as second order derivative so let's have a quick look on that hence we will pay attention only on the progress on figure 3 so let me quickly move on a different slide so this is the graph representation of the first order derivative which is differentiation of distance over time and now if we want to do the derivative of this as well so let's say we want to see that how with the small change in time this value is changing then that will be denoted as d square distance by dt square this is the notation for the second order derivative so let's do that as well so as we can see we started from the point zero and we started with a slower speed which can be represented with this slope and then on this point the speed started increasing and then it started decreasing from this point so we can draw different different slopes in order to represent these progresses and again if i'll have to show you on a clean figure then it will look something like this so on this figure we are doing the differentiation of this slope m which is nothing but the speed and we are checking that how with a small change in time which is d by dt how the speed is changing which is nothing but derivative of distance over small change in time and the final result will be the acceleration that will be the second order derivative denoted by d square d by dt square similarly you can also go for higher order derivatives like third order or fourth order but generally your understanding up to the second order derivative will be sufficient to get started with machine learning i remember that when i started studying the concepts of optimizers different different types of optimizers like adam optimizer and concepts like momentum and at that time i felt quite clueless because i had forgotten the concept of second order derivatives and then as usual i had to fall back to my mathematical studies although i had already studied 
these concepts back in college days but since i lost touch for few years i tend to forget the concepts but i hope that after understanding this lecture till this point you will not face the same issue as we discussed and let's move forward so we have seen that what is the idea behind calculating the first order derivative and second order derivative and now let's change our gears into integral calculus which is pretty much correlated to what we have been discussing so far in differential calculus so as we know that this acceleration which is also the second order derivative for the progress of distance over time if we pay attention to this figure and if we try to observe the area within these curves like we have some area over here and we also have some area over here these areas can also be represented as the total distance traveled so on the both sides we can understand by the figure that going by the area under the curve we have traveled some distance however here we have no area because we had no speed here at all we were on rest and this is why the area is flat because we did not travel any distance at all and this study of area within these curves is actually the fundamental concept of integral calculus so as we discussed integral calculus is the study of areas under the curves and for our example these areas are representing the total distance traveled in our use case and this concept of area under the curve is heavily utilized when you will study the concept of roc auc curve for a classification problem people who are already coming from a machine learning background will be able to relate over here and you will also find this concept very useful when you will do a project in classification problem in machine learning and now we will quickly discuss the topic of method of exhaustion so before i try explaining you that what these figures actually mean that you can see on the screen let me draw a rough diagram over here where we have some progress like this so again you can see on this figure our progress is changing over the time and the rate of change is different in different different points so if we talk about this particular time window from starting point till this point over here this progress can be mapped within one straight line like this again we will need another straight line where we will represent this decreasing speed over here then with the help of another straight line we will represent this point where we had no speed at all and then this one where we have a constant speed so for this particular progress we were able to cover the entire graph with the help of four to five derivatives but let's say that you want to find the derivative of a circle like this one in that case for each and every point of this circle you will have to draw a slope which will just touch the point in order to get the derivative then again for the next point you will have to draw another slope like this then again for the next point you will have to draw another slope like this and as we know there will be infinite number of points within this circle and hence the slopes that we will need to draw in order to find the derivative will also be in a count of infinite and this is the concept of method of exhaustion so on the first figure that you can see on the bottom left in order to find the area of this circle if you draw only these four lines you can get the area of this square but you will also end up missing the areas outside the square which is a part of the circle so of course this square is not giving you the complete area of the circle that we have you can draw a hexagon and even if you calculate the area for the hexagon you will still end up missing some points even if you try to calculate the area of an octagon you still won't be able to get the exact area of the circle and hence you will have to draw infinite number of slopes on the last circle in order to get the exact area for it so this is a quick topic that i wanted to cover the understanding on this topic will come very handy when you will study the topic of gradient descent and it is the pretty much extremely basic things that we need to know in calculus before moving into machine learning of course the scope is endless that how much you can study in calculus but if you are able to understand these small things like first order derivative second order derivative integral calculus etc then comparatively your learning curve will be very very smooth now let's quickly talk about the applications that we have been anyways discussing throughout so differentials are heavily used for finding the maxima or minima of a curve let's say that you have a curve like this then if you keep on finding the derivative of different different points like here 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 and here then here then we know that all these slopes which we also represented as m 
has some value on different different points and the point where m has the lowest value let's say 0 that would be called as minima and the point where m has the highest value let's say this one that could be considered as maxima the concept of higher order derivatives is used in optimizers and there are different different types of optimizers but more or less everywhere you will find the applications of second order or higher order derivative where we are doing nothing but trying to find the derivative of another derivative the concept of integral calculus is used for roc and so on so application is not only limited to these pointers but these are the major topics in machine learning where the understanding of basic calculus will be pretty much required now let's discuss few important rules in derivative that you should always keep in mind first is derivative of a constant so let's say you are trying to find that how the value of y is changing with the small change in x in that case if y is a constant then the derivative for this will equals to zero and it also makes sense because let's say if we have a plot of y against x and let's say the progress looks something like this which means for any given interval there is a change in x however the value of y is absolutely constant it is not changing over time in that case of course if we try to draw a slope the value of this slope will be equals to zero but let's say the value of y is varying over the time it has some variation in that case if you try to draw different different slopes then all these slopes will have some value maybe for a straight slope it will be zero but for all the other slopes the y will have some value and this is why for any constant term if you will try to find the derivative the value or output will always be zero and then let's understand about the power rule so the power rule says that if we try to find out the derivative of x to the power n first the value of n will come ahead of x and it will be multiplied with x to the power n minus 1 which means that let's say we want to find out the derivative of dy cube with respect to dx then it will be 3y then 3 minus 1 which is y square and then we have the constant multiple rule so let's say you want to find the derivative of cz with respect to x and let's say that c is a constant then first you take out c from this derivative and then you will have to do the derivative of only z and you will get this so let's say that the value of c is 5 which is constant and the value of z is x cube so we need to find out the derivative of 5 x cube then 5 will come out of the calculation and for x cube as we know by the power rule the derivative will be 3 x square and 5 multiplied by 3 x square we will have 15 x square now let's quickly cover the sum rule so let's say we need to find the derivative of y plus z with respect to x so y plus z is the function of x which means with the small change in x the change we will have will be y plus z so we will need to do the derivative of y and z separately like we are doing over here and their sum will be the final output that we require so let's say the value of y is x cube and value of z will be x to the power 5. So we will have to do a separate differentiation for both the terms and then we will sum up the output as simple as that. And the product rule is also pretty much similar to the sum rule. So let's say that y multiplied by z is the function of x. In that case, of course, we will have to do the derivative separately for both of these terms. But when we are doing the derivative of the first term, the second term will be considered as constant. So here you can see when I am doing the derivative of y i have kept z as constant and then keeping y as constant i am doing the derivative of z and the final output will be the answer and then we have fraction rule so let's say that w by z is the function of x then the derivative calculation has to be done in this way so all we are doing is we have multiplied z on both the sides so on bottom we have z square and on the top we will get w z so when we are multiplying it on both the sides we will have w z here and z square at the bottom so we will keep the denominator as constant which is z square and on the top where we have w z we will apply the product rule that we have discussed earlier and then finally let's discuss about the chain rule this idea will come really really handy when you will study the forward and backward propagation within gradient descent or optimization but let's discuss first that what is the need of using the chain rule you can see the value of y is a complicated term and it will be very difficult to calculate the dy by dx directly over here in this case however it can be simplified a lot if we break down this value in two parts 
let's take the internal part first which is 4x cube plus 5 and let's consider it as u in that case it will be very easy to find du by dx and then we can consider this entire part as u square and considering the value of y as u square again it will become very easier to do the derivative of y as well so let's first take the internal part which is 4x cube plus 5 and we consider it as u and first we are calculating the du by dx since 5 is constant the derivative of 5 will be 0 and finally we will have 12x square so we have du by dx already calculated then considering this entire term as u square the value of y also becomes u square and then we do the derivative of dy by du which will again be 2u going by the power root and since we already have the value of u if we put it over here in this equation this will be the final output so now we also have calculated dy by du and if we multiply both these products then du and du will cancel each other and we will finally conclude our dy by dx which was initially a bit difficult going by this complicated term so all i'm doing here on the third box i'm calculating the dy by dx by simply multiplying the value of dy by du that we calculated here on the first box and then du by dx that we calculated on the second box and the product of these two outputs will be the final answer for dy by dx again i am saying this idea and this concept of chain rule is extremely extremely useful when you will study forward and backward propagation and optimization within gradient descent so if you understand this topic then you will have a good foundation strong foundation in order to study the ml concepts and that is it for today's lecture i understand that we have covered a lot of topics within this particular lecture but you will realize that how important all of these things were once you move into machine learning or if you are already coming from a machine learning background then most probably i don't have to explain anything to you you already know how important all of these topics were i would also suggest that you save this video in your youtube playlist if you have a playlist in your youtube account otherwise you can simply save it in your watch later list because going forward maybe after a couple of months if you tend to forget any of these concepts then you can simply fall back to this lecture let me know your thoughts in the comment box if you found this video helpful also let me know if you find any kind of problem in terms of my explanation or way of teaching i will try to improvise accordingly subscribe to the channel and drop a like below to support our work and hopefully i will see you in the next lecture thank you very much for your time take care